Have you ever had those thoughts and you thought, that is a great idea? And then comes time to do it? When I had this idea like, hey, let's just get two messages ready and let people vote, I thought, that sounds like a great idea. Now, we're about to find out if it was or not. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know about you, but uh, I'm sure your, you know, 2022 year went exactly as planned. Everything in it was like, perfect, check the box, done, don't need to go back because it was awesome. Okay, mine wasn't like that. So this may be like, you know, um, this may be like preaching to the choir, which in this case might be myself, but I thought it would be good if we could remember uh, what's God up to? Are there some guarantees we can have in 23? Because here's what I know, that maybe in this first 10 hours and 20 minutes you have been living in 2023, your year has gone exactly as planned. I mean, nothing has messed up. Your alarm clock went off. You got dressed. You planned to be here. You were here. You dreamed that Hadley Kibbe was going to be here today, and she was, and it's awesome, and it's gone good, and the next big decision is, where's lunch? But I've been around the sun a few times and figured out that life doesn't always go as we expect. But are there some things that we can expect in life? Are there some things that we can kind of plan on to be constant and true no matter what goes on in our lives? And so I thought, let's talk about that. And the idea of WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get. We're going to focus on the see because what you see is what you'll get. And in really from God. And we're going to dive into a story where Jesus answers a question that his boys ask him uh, that they didn't expect the answer that they got to the question that they asked. And it really threw them for a loop. And also it kind of sent the rest of the boys who heard their question into a tizzy about them. And I think as we look at this, we can see some things that Jesus is trying to do in us that he is always trying to do in us, even when things don't go exactly as planned. And so and if you're new to the Bible, we're going to be in the New Testament looking at one of the author's books. His name was Mark. He was the youngest of the writers uh, of the New Testament. The dude was fascinated by the miracles. He was this young buck. He was going, check that out, and then he wrote it down. Um, but here's how the Bible kind of is laid out for you. Uh, if you take a look at your Bible, the first half of the Bible uh, is called the Old Testament. Uh, some call it the Hebrew Bible, but it really is the history of God interacting with a group of people that we know as the Hebrews or the Jews. And in them, he wove the story of, the, of him coming into the world as their savior, but he taught them how to live together in community. So he gave them a bunch of laws. They had a hard time following those things. So he said, hey, one day we're going to fix this whole thing, and a Messiah, a savior is going to come. The right half of your Bible is called the New Testament. And it is the writings of those, many of those who are eyewitnesses of Jesus coming and telling his story that Jesus was actually the Messiah that the Old Testament told you was coming and that Jesus came. And it was about his life and it was about his, the way he taught us and the things that he taught us how to live. But then he died so that we could have eternal life, the forgiveness of sins and spend life here on earth and life everlasting with God in heaven. And so we're going to be in Mark's gospel, Mark's writings, Mark's account of the life of Jesus. And we're going to pick it up in chapter 10, verse 35. If you have a Bible, great. If you have a smart device, great. Uh, you can open your Bible on that. If you don't, don't sweat it. They're, everything's going to be on the screens behind you. So here we go. Mark chapter 10, and we're going to start in verse 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, uh, came to him. Uh, these two brothers, they're often called the sons of thunder, maybe because they have big personalities, maybe because they talked a lot, we're not really sure, maybe because they fought a lot like brothers, uh, we're not sure, but this is who these two guys are. They came to him and they said, hey teacher, we want you to do, some, do whatever we ask. Um, that's not always a good thing to go to God with. That's not should be like your open leading line to God. Uh, hey God, we'd like you to do whatever we want. Um, but that's what they led with, and this is what they said. We want you to do whatever, uh, what do you want me to do for you, Jesus replied. In verse 37, he says this. Wow, my notes are messed up. He says, and this is their reply to him. Let one of us sit at your right hand and one on the left when you're in glory. 
So Jesus, when you go back to heaven, what we would like is we would like some seats right next to you. Left side, right side, so people will know we're with you. And then he, Jesus said to them, you don't know what you are asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with a baptism, baptism I'm baptized with? They had no idea what was coming in a short time from now. They had no idea what his arrest, his imprisonment for the very short period of time, what his beating and his crucifixion was going to be all about. But if you're going to be bold enough to ask Jesus the question, hey, we want you to do something for us, and then he, he asks you a question or response, and you better answer this way, we can. In other words, Jesus, we can take whatever you're going to go through. And then Jesus said the words that just freaked him out. You will. You will drink the cup I drink. Be baptized with a baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left side is not for me to grant. He answered their question in a way they were not anticipating. Yeah, you're going to go through what I'm going to go through, but you can't sit in those seats. It's not for him to decide. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. So those seats have been prepared for some people to occupy. And this is where the, the, the story kind of goes sideways and the other 10 hear it. They said, when the, when the 10 heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them all together and said, hey, you know those who are regarded as the rulers of the Gentiles? They lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Then he says these words, not so with you. It's not so with you. You're not going to lord over people. You're not going to rule down over people. It's not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave of all. For even the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He begins to tell them how he's going to be and that they're going to go through those same things with him like that. So here's the big idea for the day. God is preparing you for what he has prepared for you. There were two seats prepared for some people, and he was getting them ready for those people to occupy those seats. It wasn't those boys, but he was preparing them for something. And the big idea for us is that God is preparing you, and God is preparing me for whatever he has prepared for us. So whatever he has for us in 2023, he is going to be getting us ready for this. God is going to waste nothing, and our cooperation to his pre preparation is required for us to be prepared for what he has prepared for us. So our cooperation in his preparation of us is what's required for us to be prepared for what he has prepared for us. Does that make sense? Okay, stick with me. It's the first of the year. Okay, and I wasn't even up all night, and I don't drink. Okay, Ephesians chapter 2 this writer, his name was Paul. He came later after Jesus was not an, uh, necessarily an eyewitness to all the things that Jesus did, but he was a follower of Christ who wrote most of the documents that we have that make up our New Testament. And he writes to this group of Jesus followers in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And there are a group of Christians that lived in the city of Ephesus. He says, he, meaning Jesus, creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he is doing. So God, so Jesus has created us in Christ. So when we got saved, he, he started to create in us the ability to join him in the work that he's doing. The good work he has gotten ready for us to do. So the chairs he's prepared for us, he's already gotten them ready. And it's a work that we better be doing. So Jesus has taken the time to prepare this good work for you and I to be a part of and for us to do. And he's making sure that we are ready to do the work that he asks he is setting you up. He is setting me up for success regardless of what happens in 2023, whether it goes the way we want or doesn't go as we planned. In every moment, even of 2022 and years prior to that, and in 2023 and the years following that, Jesus is going to be preparing us for the things he has for us. So what I want to do is give you seven C's that God is preparing in you, that God is preparing in me so we can be ready for what he has prepared for us. These you can count on. These you can bank on. These are the things that regardless of what happens, you can know and I can know these things God is doing in us. So here you go. Number one, whether things go 
off the rails like you didn't expect or go exactly as you planned, the first thing you can know that God is always working on in you is your character. He's always working on my character. We often think character gets defined as, as like how a person acts or what they're known for. But if you go back to the etymology of the word character, it actually the, comes from this idea of a typewriter that makes a mark. It imprints something. And Jesus is always working on us so that the mark that we make on the life and the people that are around us is always the mark of him. It's always his mark and his impression on them. James, who was a writer in the New Testament, in the first chapter of his letter to a group of Christians said this, for when, notice he doesn't say if, he says, for when the way is rough. For when the way is rough, your patience has a chance to grow. Are there verses in the Bible that you wish weren't in there? I do all the time. This would be one of them because he says, the way is going to be rough, not, when, not if it is, but when it is. And then your patience, meaning that you're going to have to have some patience, it has a chance to grow. So however small your patience are, you can say, I have a short fuse. Guess what? You still have a little bit of patience because that fuse is your patience level, right? It has a chance to grow. So rough times equal opportunity to be patient. And he says, so let it grow. Don't try to squirm out of your problems. Thank you so much. James, because that's what we would like to do. Exit stage left and leave the problems where they were and not have to face them. But he says, if you'll face your problems, you will learn and grow in patience. For when your patience is finally in full bloom, like it can happen. Like when your patience is finally in full bloom, then you'll be ready for anything. You'll be prepared, strong in character, full and complete. So when things don't go as planned, God is always working on our character, and our character and our patience will always be in development. And our character is predicated on our ability to be patient. Number two, Jesus will always be working on this. He'll always be preparing us for our commitment. For our commitment. This is that thing that says, you're going to do what you said you're going to do. It is not about you signing up to do something and having no intention of doing it or even having a good intention of doing it. When Jesus speaks about commitment, it is like follow through. It's like get it done. You sign up, you do it. And commitment com comes straight out of our character. It's about making and keeping them. It's that thing that builds our character and builds our integrity. And here's why this is so important. In, our, in the Old Testament, one of, the, one of the writers said to uh, the Hebrew people, he says, look, this is what you need to know about commitment and about how it impacts where it is with God and how God sees it. He says, the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. To the people who have moved and devoted themselves in his direction, that's who God is looking for so he can strengthen them. So that when things go off the rails and not say, God, I'm staying true to you. I'm holding on to you. I said I'm going to stay with you. I'm going to lean hard into you even though I don't like these circumstances. I'm not going to try to wiggle my way out. And I'll be patient so that you can strengthen me because I am committed to you. Does that make sense? So you can always be guaranteed that he's going to work on your character. He's going to work on your commitment. Third, one we mo oftentimes we don't ever think about. We all think about it when it comes to like someone like Pastor Nick or anybody who is in pastoral ministry, this idea of calling. He's always going to be working on our calling. Again, the writer Paul wrote to a group of Christians in a church in Ephesus. He says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. So what calling have we received is those who say we follow Jesus, the calling as his child, that he has called us and adopted us into a relationship that can never be broken, that can never be taken away, that can never be ended, that he has chosen to adopt us in. And we have a calling as his kids to learn to live in his family and be a part of that family and what that family 
is like. And the second is that calling is as his representatives. We're not just a part of his family, but we represent him outside these walls. We rep tell people what he is like by the way that we live and by the way that we love one another. Jesus went on to say, he said, hey, if you do that, that's how everybody's going to know that you follow me. That's how everybody will know. And then we have a calling to learn how to be his family and a calling to learn how to represent him to the world around us. And he leans into that. And what that means is that every moment is a clarifying moment. Every moment, whether we have disagreement or we have agreement, whether the vote that we took in the beginning led into a battle between those that thought, no, hey, it was option two that won, not option one that won. And then we got half the building that said, hey, we're going we're gonna to throw down and throw hands over this whole thing, right? I mean, every situation that we're in is an opportunity for clarifying who we are as his family and how we're going to represent him. Every moment is a refining moment, meaning the opportunity for us to love better and to care more and to dive into this family that he has given us more. And there are just some moments in life, and they're the ones where we, he talked earlier, right? The ones that, that don't go right, when life is rough, when it didn't go as planned. There are some of those moments that are just redefining moments where we have to say, you know what? We've gotten off track. Man, when my life has departed from the things that I said, the things that belong in God's family, the things that are characteristics of God's family, things that are a part of the characteristics of learning and expressing who Jesus is to our world. And they're redefining moments regarding our calling as his kids and his representatives in this world. Number four, our competence. He will always work on our competence. He will always be building our competence in things. Ecclesiastes, who was written by Solomon, uh, who was the son of David, claimed to be the wisest man in the whole world. But, I mean, how wise can you be if you got 750 wives and 350 concubines? I mean, come on. Um, but he, he wrote some stuff. And this is one thing he wrote that, that has some real merit to it that we can think about, that we often don't think about when it comes to following Jesus. Ecclesiastes 10.10 10 says this, If the axe is dull and its edge unsharpened, more strength is needed. But skill will bring success. Skill will bring success. Not everything requires a bigger hammer. Sometimes in life and in our relationships, the more skilled we can be, the easier it will be. But if we continue to think that everything is a nail and it just needs a bigger hammer, right, the more pain that it will cause, the more damage we may be doing. So here's some situational things. I was thinking about this last night. What are the chances, things that we could improve on? Because I don't know what y'all do for a living. I don't know what your job skills are required. But I do know there are some things that, that the scriptures teach that all of us can be more skilled at and need to be skilled and need to lean into because they're the things that God's Holy Spirit indwelling us is trying to produce through us. And here they are. So everything in life gives us a chance to do this, to improve our ability to love. You've heard me say it a thousand times, but our ability to love people and to give love and even be on the receiving end of love. The ability to be patient, kind, good, faithful, gentle, and have self-control. Those are skills that we all can work on, that we all can develop, that every life situation gives us the opportunity to start sharpening our life around those things. And it's how we treat one another because life is about how we interact together, not about how we do life on our own. Does that make sense? That these are skills that we all can possess. And here's the beautiful thing, that these are things that, and skills that the Holy Spirit is already trying to produce in us. And the scripture calls it the fruit of the spirit. A couple things. Fruit. It doesn't benefit the tree. An apple doesn't benefit the apple tree. But the quality of the apple just tells you the health of the tree. So it could be that our capacity to love and be patient and kind and all those things, they could be indicators of the health of our life. 
but they are always for the benefit of the other person. And the apple tree gets joy because it's producing something that someone else enjoys. And here's the crazy thing about apples. They all produce and hold seed inside that produces another tree that produces fruit. And while you and I may be able to count the seeds in an apple, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithful, and gentle, self-control, let's just say those are the seeds. We can never count the number of apples that seed has within it. And God is saying, look, get competent at these things and the situations of our life, whether they go good, bad, or not as planned, or rough, as the scripture says, hey, those are the things, right? If you'll lean in, you have the opportunity to get competent in these things. And you'll bless people around you and crazy, your life will get healthy. Five, compassion. Compassion. Jesus was, uh, saw this large crowd of people following him one day and it says that he had the Lord, compassion on them. And he starts sitting down to teach him. It's funny that the, the writer didn't pick that he had uh, indifference toward them. Like, oh my gosh, they showed up late to my meeting and now they want me to do something for them. He didn't have indifference for them. He didn't have, you know, impatience for them. He didn't have judgment for them. He had compassion on them. And compassion is this word. It means to suffer with. In order to do that, it requires close proximity. To hear someone's story, to know their story, know what's going on. It's proximity that changes our perspective. And when life doesn't go the way our way that we want, it doesn't go the, the way that we had planned or is expected, is that God is always allowing us to walk then in the shoes of someone else whose life hasn't gone as planned or expected. So we can begin to experience compassion, to suffer with them. It's the opportunity for our compassion to grow when we walk in the shoes of others by walking in the rough times and the unexpected just life curveballs that come our way. Does that all make sense? And so God uses the stuff in us that doesn't go as planned to teach us to be compassionate toward others because that's exactly what people to be toward us when it doesn't go like we want. Six, here's a weird one. It's chemistry. He's always working on our chemistry. And I'm not talking about biochemistry or the chemistry that you can put stuff together and make it explosive. But in Romans, Paul, again, he writes to another group of Christians that gathered uh, in Rome. He says, be devoted to one another. Now, remember, Rome next to Jerusalem was the highest concentration of uh, persecution among those who were followers of Jesus at the time. So he writes these Christians who live in a, in a city where they are the most persecuted. And he says this, be devoted to one another in love. Be devoted to one another in love and honor one another above yourselves. How we handle when others fail, how we handle conflict, and how we handle it when we fail and others offer us a hand of help, that tells a lot about us, doesn't it? And chemistry within the body of Christ comes when we learn to love and honor one another when we're together. It seems redundant when we start talking about the skills that he wants us to have, right? The competencies we want us to have, but this is what life is about, right? It's about us. It's about people. It's about the gathering together with God's family and how we handle it, right? Is what allows us to have peace and joy it's what allows us to have patience where we can express kindness and goodness and faithfulness. We can express to others what Christ has expressed to us. That's why he said, hey, love one another just as I have loved you. Forgive one another just as I have forgiven you. And then in those things, we start to experience the chemistry within the body of Christ. And here's what we discover. That it requires all of us to reflect the beauty of Jesus perfectly. Nobody is exempt from that. Nobody is unnecessary in that. And that we need one another. And God is always putting us in situations, allowing things to, 
to happen. And usually they're relationally, and sometimes it's over stuff, and sometimes it's over whatever, in order that we might learn how to love one another, be devoted to one another, because the chemistry matters, because when we get it right, there is nothing like the beauty of the body of Christ, the, the followers of Jesus who gather together in his name, when we get it right. There is nothing like that. You can't get that anywhere else. So he's always leading us into this thing about our chemistry. Number seven, courage. He's always working on our courage. Paul wrote to, again, the gather, those that gathered in Corinth, he says, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous and strong. If it was easy to follow Jesus, it would just be easy. But it's not easy. It requires courage. It requires facing down the things that scare us the most. It requires us facing down the things that tell you, hey, you failed so big. It can't be made up. Jesus, look, there is courage that is necessary and needed. It's courage that we lean in and we, and, we, and we learn to become who he saved us to be. It's going to require courage for us to do that. When we've made commitments and haven't kept them, it requires courage to go back and say, you know what, I made that commitment and I didn't keep it. And I'm re-upping and we're going at it again. That when a relationship goes south, it takes courage to walk up there and say, you know what? Here's the story I told myself, and that's why I reacted the way I did. It takes courage to go to someone and say, hey, I need you to forgive me because. Because you don't know what they're gonna, how they're going to react. But in the body of Christ, we ought to react by, I already forgave you. We're good. We're moving on. It's going to require courage. Following Jesus is not an easy life. It is just the best life. And it will require courage to allow him to come and say, there's plans and there's stuff going on inside of me. And what Jesus, I need you to do is keep working them out. Because what I see, I'd like to be better. What I see, I'd like to grow in. What I see, I'd like to be more like you. I promise you, in 2023, it's not all going to go the way you expected. Before you uh, get to lunch, somebody will want to go to the different restaurant that you don't want to go to. <laughs> Your team may not win the national championship. I didn't get an amen. Amen. big Tennessee fan. But what you can count on is even when it doesn't, God is still with you and God is still at work to form in you the life of his son, Jesus. And as we allow that to happen, that's what will make a beautiful, beautiful life. A life that people will want to be around. A life that people will say, can you tell me why when that went south, you didn't go south? Can you tell me why you lean into Jesus and lean into your church and the gathering there when you got the news you got? See, you and I, we can know that Jesus will do these things. And all we have to do He's just looking his direction. And when it happens, go, Jesus, what are you doing in me through this for your sake and your glory so others can see you're good? Let's pray. Father, thanks for today, for the opportunity that we have to gather in your name. chance to laugh a minute, but also to realize that uh, when life doesn't go the way we want, 
you are always working on the things that we need. So help us be aware of that and mindful of that. No matter what 2023 brings. In Jesus' name. Everybody said?